Hey there scholars and welcome back or welcome to my YouTube channel of where I cover education, scholarships, and professional development. I'm Daniela and today we will be discussing all things FAFSA related. Also, if you want to learn alternative ways to pay for school outside of the FAFSA and outside of student loans, I actually have a free training relating to just that, which I will link down below in the description box. Speaking of alternative aid, here's a tip. If you or perhaps someone you know doesn't qualify for the FAFSA, just know that some states have alternative forms for you to fill out to instead receive state aid as opposed to federal aid. For instance, if you're in Texas like me and you don't qualify to complete the FAFSA, you can instead fill out the TAFSA. I also have more information about these state alternatives in my free financial aid toolkit, so make sure to download it. Okay, back to the video. Let's delve into the key highlights of the upcoming likely changes to the FAFSA. Also, as a disclaimer, the information I will be sharing with you all are according to various news sources such as from USA Today, Kiplinger, Nerd Wallet, and the Federal Student Aid website. So if you want to stay ahead of the curve and potentially maximize your financial aid opportunities, then don't forget to hit that subscribe button and follow me on Instagram and TikTok for more content just like this. Well. Let's jump right into the details. So if you are already familiar with filling out the FAFSA before, you would know what the term Expected Family Contribution, or EFC for short, is. However, this is now being replaced as a Student Aid Index, SAI for short. So with the EFC, if you didn't already know, it is an index number used by colleges to determine a family's financial need relative to other applicants. And the reasoning behind changing the name is meant to address confusions and misconceptions associated with the term. The term EFC has often led to misunderstandings standings amongst families as it implies that it represents either the exact amount that they have to pay for college or the amount of aid they will receive. However, this has not always been the case. The name SAI is expected to help clarify the true nature of this index number. The index SAI should be viewed as a number used by colleges to assess a family's financial need. It is not the exact amount that families are required or obligated to pay that college. Instead, it serves as an indicator for colleges to evaluate a family's financial circumstances and to determine the level of financial aid they may be eligible for. And with that being said, I highly recommend that you guys download my free financial aid toolkit and one of the resources within it is a guideline on how to potentially get even more money from the FAFSA. See every single year families across the nation fill it out wrong and end up disqualifying themselves for aid that they could have had had they filled it out properly. So if you don't want to make those same mistakes, then go to the description box down below to download the toolkit. I also wanted to jump here and say that your parent must create his or her own separate FSA ID, meaning that if you are classified as a dependent for the FAFSA, that both you as a student and you as a parent must create separate accounts on the studentaid.gov website. And for those students who perhaps have a parent who doesn't have a social security number, which may be the case for various non-citizens in the United States, just know that the SSN is required to create an FSA ID. So if you don't have an SSN, in, then here's what you need to do. Pause to read this screen here as well as this screen. Now this next change is not so good for families who will have multiple people in college at the same time. See, up until now, financial aid eligibility has increased for families with multiple children enrolled in college simultaneously. This meant that parents with twins, multiples, or children closer in age could potentially benefit from this discount. It provided valuable financial support to families navigating the cost of multiple college educations, right? However, recent legislation has brought about changes to the FAFSA. And one significant adjustment is the elimination of the discount for families with multiple children in college. This change will impact the financial aid eligibility of families in this situation. To better visualize it, let's take a closer look at an example. So previously, a family with a calculated expected family contribution, EFC for short, of $50,000 could see that drop by as much as 50% if they had two students in college, resulting in the EFC being $25,000 per student. However, without this discount, the expected 
suspected EFC, which again will soon be referred to as the SEI, would be $50,000 per student. This can affect students tremendously for eligibility for the Pell Grant or even certain scholarships that require to know your EFC slash SAI number. So please keep that in mind. And also tying into this negative change, I wanted to highlight this tip I saw from a New York Times article. It says, while the number of students in college is no longer a factor in the federal formula, meaning you can no longer get a discount via the FAFSA from it, the FAFSA still asks a question about the number of family members in college. Therefore, colleges can still take that information into consideration and potentially make adjustments under a process known as professional judgment. So if a student receives an aid package Package from a college that falls short, it is recommended to reach out to the financial aid office at that school to see what can be done, meaning negotiating for financial aid by telling them that your family is already paying for another person in college and if they can potentially lower your cost of attendance, such as a tuition discount or to give additional scholarship money to partially or fully cover your expenses. So moving forward here, one of the major changes coming to the FAFSA application is a simplified format. The aim is to stream streamline the application process, making it easier for students and families to complete. As I am recording this video, the FAFSA currently has a little over 100 questions to answer. However, this is expected to be reduced to around three dozen, so around 36 questions instead. The updated FAFSA will feature a more user-friendly interface and have easier to understand wording throughout the application, making it more accessible for people to read. After all, research suggests that around 40% of Americans read at a middle school reading level. Now let's talk about about the Pell Grant. The federal Pell Grant program is the largest source of financial aid offered by the federal government specifically designed for students with exceptional financial need. It provides significant financial assistance to eligible students pursuing higher education. So to determine eligibility for the Pell Grant, amendments have been made to the FAFSA. The updated process considers both the adjusted gross income, AGI for short, and soon to be SAI. These factors help evaluate an applicant's eligibility for Pell Grant awards. Additionally, students will have the ability to estimate estimate their eligibility for the Pell Grant before completing the FAFSA, which is super helpful rather than hoping and waiting months to see if you will get the funding. For instance, the FAFSA recently published this lookup table to help you with determining how much Pell Grant money you can potentially receive. Now, to learn how to calculate this, read this article from bestcollege.com, which will also be linked in the description box down below, as well as within my free financial aid toolkit. And this will also better prepare you for what types of scholarships you should primarily focus on, whether they are need-based, merit-based, and so forth. And speaking of scholarships, that is what I mainly talk about on here, by the way, if you would like to increase your chances of winning, then consider getting my scholarship strategy book and or program, all of which can be found in my description box box down below. See, I was in a situation of where I no longer qualified for the Pell Grant due to my dad getting a raise at his job, so I didn't get much aid from the FAFSA and that's why I focused so heavily on scholarships and ended up winning 30 between undergrad and graduate school. And the same can be said with this parent enrolled in my scholarship program for her son. They come from a higher income household based out in California and despite that, her son was able to win 10 back-to-back -back scholarships. So even if your family makes more money, still apply for scholarships. But time back to the Pell Grant here, the maximum Pell Grant award is a little over $7,000, but it's important to note that award amounts can vary annually. Currently, students with an EFC of $6,656 or less qualify for the full award. It's also worth mentioning that the Pell Grant eligibility is based on the SAI, the college's cost of attendance, enrollment status, and the student's intended academic year length. So, currently families are required to report any financial support received from others on behalf of the student. This includes contributions from grandparents, relatives, friends, or anyone outside the immediate family. Such assistance is considered as untaxed income, which can increase the student's overall income and subsequently their EFC number. Now, let's consider an example to illustrate the potential financial consequences. Imagine a grandparent generously contributes $30,000 from their 529 plan towards college tuition in the year of 2022. Unfortunately, this contribution would be treated as a student's untaxed income, resulting in an increased EFC of up to $15,000, so 50% off of the $30,000, and thus reducing their eligibility for a lot of need-based financial aid. However, under the upcoming FSA amendments, contributions made by others will no longer carry financial consequences, so outside financial support to help cover college costs will not be considered as a student's untaxed income, therefore eliminating the negative impact on their financial aid eligibility. So yay!
With that all being said, I actually only covered five of these expected changes, but there are in fact even more, such as how the FAFSA will be accessible in more languages rather than just English and Spanish, or how things are potentially changing for those doing the application with divorced parents and so forth. So if you want to learn more about these additional changes, then go to my bio description box down below of where I have linked my direct news sources that provided me with these details to provide you with the details. See, at first with this video, I was going to mention all all these changes but I didn't want to throw too much information at you guys all at once because it might feel overwhelming and two the journalist in me wants to encourage you to read news articles that's what I studied during undergrad by the way but anywho that's it for today's video was this helpful if so comment below thumbs up the video and share it with others and also check out my other content on TikTok and Instagram for additional advice and once again head down to the description box down below now for my resources such as free financial aid training toolkits with templates my services and more and with that all being said that is my cue to conclude this video bye